Well, today we're continuing in our study of you know, what is a disciple according to Jesus. And, and of course, why do we care what a disciple is? Well, we care what a disciple is because a healthy church is, is a community of disciples. A healthy church is not just Christians who get together. It's not just a, a community. It's not just people who are faithful. But a healthy church is a church that's, that, is, that is made up of people who are disciples. Um, this goes against a lot of what we've been kind of taught about Christianity, especially in, in America and especially in, throughout the latter half of the 20th century. We were taught so much that Christianity, you know, being a Christian just means you, you prayed a prayer and you confessed your sins and you accepted Jesus, and that's good enough. And that was it. And that's all that there was to it. When in fact, it wasn't just that, that we've accepted something in name, but what, what was, should have happened is that when we became Christians, what should have happened is we should have been changed. And we should have been changed in one way is that we, we received God's Spirit. And what God's Spirit should have been doing in our lives from that time forward is, is teaching us. And what is a disciple? It's a student, someone who's being taught. And so it's important that as we've gone through the Sermon on the Mount, and I encourage you, that if you've somehow missed these, or sometimes it's good to go back and, and listen to them a second time, um, is to go and you know, listen to our sermons. Go back over this series. Maybe at some point you'll go back and go, oh, that's what he was talking about back then. Sometimes when we have time to think about things we, um, and time to reflect and we're not here at this place, you know, it, it connects with us in a different way. So I'd encourage you to do that. Today we're going to talk about, you know, what is the highest priority for a disciple? Now this word priority is one that is kind of used in strategic ways in, um, you know, in, in our world today. So there's, a, there's several ways when people say priority what they really mean. So what they really mean is they might just mean it's a priority, which means it's it's one of many. I've got 12 priorities, which means 12 things that I really want to do. This is one of them. That's not your highest priority. That's a way that we try to make somebody feel good, like, yeah, I'm thinking of you, and you're on my list of things to do, but you're not at the top. The second one is to say, priority means it's my top priority. But even then, that's kind of like, Top priority just means you're at the top of the list. You may be number one, but there's a really close second. And sometimes, not just a close second, there's a close third and a close fourth. And so even though I say it's my top priority, it's not really functioning as a top priority. Well, I could also say it's my highest priority. Highest kind of gives a stronger sense to it. It's not just at the top of the list. It's really way up there. And that's what we're talking about today. It doesn't make sense to say it's my only priority. Because priority means you have more than one thing going on. I don't need priorities if I only have one thing to do that I need to do. If I only have one thing that I really need to do, it's just do it. I don't have to prioritize. But if I say it's my highest priority, what does that mean? It's not just one of many. It's not just the top where there's, a, there's several really close ones. But the highest priority takes on kind of this, this special meaning. And there's a reason for a disciple, your highest pro priority needs to be the right priority because if you get this right, it, makes, it puts everything else in order. It puts everything else in its place. If you get the highest priority right, it orders everything else. When I was, a, uh, when I was training to be a journalist, and I was you know, going to school at the University of Hawaii and all of that, 
one of the things they would tell us is that the most important sentence when you write a news story is your first sentence. It's called the lead. I said, if you get that right, the rest of the story falls into place. And they would say, if you have an hour to write a story, which sometimes in radio and television we had less than an hour, but if you have an hour to write a story, spend half the time writing the first sentence. And then the rest will take care of itself. It's the same kind of idea. When I talk to people about marriage, when I do marriage counseling, what I tell them is that when you get married, what you are saying is, other than our relationship to God, the highest priority, the highest relationship is our marriage relationship. There can be no rival. There cannot be a close second. It cannot be one of many. That's how people get into trouble. That's how marriages get into trouble. It's because one or both partners treats the marriage relationship as an important relationship, but not the highest priority. And that's one of the reasons what often, when this often comes up is when you start having kids. And you start having kids and all of a sudden, the relationship to the kids becomes the, the highest priority. It's one of the things that's actually become very destructive in our society. Our society, and I'm talking about American society, and, I, and I'm not talking about right now, I am talking about right now, but this started back maybe in the 60s, where our society became kid-centric. Everything was about the kids. The family was about the kids. You know, it was, every goal was how do we, how do we, you know, meet the needs of the kids? You know, how do we uh, make sure the kids are happy? How do we make sure they're educated? And this kind of fits into that kind of local, you know, our kind of local Asian mentality that highly values education. We value it so much that, you know, when I used to work at HBA, there would be parents that would drop their kids off before 7 a.m. and not pick them up until after 7 p.m. For 12 hours out of the day, they're not with their kids. And why? Because education became so much more important. Now, this would be okay if mom and dad were saying, hey, HBA, take care of my kids for 12 hours. Mom and I, we're going to the spa. Or, you know, we're gonna grab lunch. But no, what was happening? Well, to pay for the school, Oftentimes, mom and dad were working, either overtime, working a couple extra jobs. So what happened? Well, not only was the relationship to the kids, you know, be, became too important, there was the neglect of even that relationship. What became more important was the kids' relationship to the school. And somewhere back, two or three layers back, is relationship of husband and wife. You want to get this right? The husband-wife relationship has to be the highest priority. And all the other things will come into place. But that doesn't sound right. We don't like to do it. We like to, we like to do other things. Sometimes husband-wife relationship isn't going as well as we thought. And so, hey, substitute with parent-child relationships. Sometimes not going as well as we thought, so, hey, I'm going to focus on my career. I'm going to do something else. And this whole kind of worship of things other than the, making the, hus the husband-wife relationship the highest priority has led to the breakdown of marriages. Breakdown of marriages leads to the breakdown in families. Breakdown in families leads to the reordering of society. It's not an accident, by the way. This isn't just something that's happened that's out of control. There's, don't have time to get into it, but there's been a concerted effort 
to redefine family that dates back over a hundred years. But anyways, kind of getting off track here, let me come back. What is the highest priority for the disciple? How can we keep this husband-wife relationship in the right place? Well, the priority should be God's kingdom. Now, as soon as I say that, there are some people in this room that think they know what I'm talking about, and then there's other people in this room who don't really know. They have kind of a vague idea of what God's kingdom is, but they don't really know what it is, and they maybe think it's something that's going to happen someday, and not necessarily for now. But for now, just introducing this idea, let me just tell you, if we make God's kingdom our highest priority as disciples, it puts everything else in the right order. It puts everything else in the right perspective. Husband-wife relationships, if we really understand what God's kingdom is, and if we're both believers, and we both want to do our part to build God's kingdom, we'll get that spouse relationship right. We will not get distracted because we understand it. God's kingdom puts everything else in the right priority. But here's something. Here's something that may not be true about this group here. It might be true. But I think it's certainly true about a lot of Christians in general. And I think it's really true about the world in general. That if someone could give a clear articulation of what God's kingdom is, a lot of people would not want it. They wouldn't want it. Or they would want it, but they would think it comes at too high of a price. So, with much fear and trepidation, I'm going to look at the scriptures today and help us understand what God's kingdom is, realizing that some of you, once you hear it and you see what it is, you're not going to want it. And that some of you are going to say, yeah, that's nice, but the price is too high. There are other things I would rather make as the highest priority. And so this text, as we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, is from Matthew chapter 6. And we're looking at the very last part, 25 through 34. And here again, Jesus is continuing to teach his followers what it means to be his disciple. And so he says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What will you eat or what will you drink? Nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let me help some of you, because if you're like me, you've been taught that this passage of scripture is about something that it's not about. In fact, I used to 
think it was about something that it's not about. And in fact, I probably have taught people that it's something that it's not about. People look at this and they think like, oh, this is about God saying he's going to meet my needs. This is about God saying, don't worry. Don't be anxious. He's going to meet my needs. That's not the main message of this. That's the setup. It's not the main message. The setup is to talk about this. The setup is to get you in the right frame of mind to hear the message. But we get distracted. In fact, our distraction based on need and worry is proof that Jesus is right. It's proof that our human nature focuses on our needs. So even when the point of this passage is something other than your physical needs, that's all you can think about when you read it. It's proof. And we miss the, the emphasis. We miss the message. It's not secret. It's not hidden. It's right there. It's pretty plain. But what happens is we, we, we miss it. When I used to teach at the college, I used to talk about, um, when we're talking about the life of Jesus, we'd talk about parables. And we'd say, one of the strengths of parables is that parables were, were stories about common things. Because sometimes a pastor or a teacher is, is so good at telling a story to illustrate a point that people don't know what the point is. They just remember it was a great story. Or worse, you know, having grown up, going to church my whole life as a growing young man, the worst was when the pastor would use an illustration using food. Because as soon as he started talking about food, all I could think about was lunch. Right? It's distracting. He starts talking about needs, and he does it in this beautiful way. He talks about the birds, he talks about the flowers, and how God meets their needs. That we're like, needs, needs, needs. Oh, so this is a promise God's going to meet my needs. No! This is direction. This is instruction. Perhaps even command. What is it? It's right there. Chapter 6, verse 33. What does he say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the message. The message isn't God's going to meet your needs. The message isn't don't be worried, don't be anxious. The message is seek God's kingdom and his righteousness first. That's the message. You get it. That's the highest priority. His kingdom and his righteousness. We have to not be drawn away to saying, yeah, 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 but he's going to meet my needs, right? He's going to meet my needs, right? If you're still obsessed with God meeting your needs, you're actually doing the opposite of what Jesus is saying to do in this passage. He says, seek first. Seek first his kingdom. Seek first his righteousness. That's what disciples do. And there is no rival. There is no rival. God's kingdom is their highest priority. But here's the problem. As we talked about earlier, people only have a kind of vague understanding of what his kingdom is. Some people think like kingdom is heaven. Heaven is eternal life. So Focusing on the kingdom is just sharing the gospel. Sharing the gospel is a very important part of it. But that's not it. That's not all of it. What is this kingdom? 
Well, one of the ways we understand kingdom is his kingdom is where he reigns. Now, you might go, well, God is sovereign over all, so he reigns everywhere. Yeah, that's true. But the way the Bible talks about this is like it's where God's rule, where God's reign shows up, manifests, appears. So sometimes Jesus would say things like, you know, when you do these things in my name, know that the kingdom of God is at hand. He didn't mean the kingdom of God is coming. He's saying, no, it's at hand. It's right here. His kingdom is where he reigns. What's the evidence of that? How do we know? Well, in an individual sense, in an internal sense, this is how you know. One of the ways you know is that you know, as Paul talks about, that, in, that inside of you there's still that natural person that wants to do what natural people do. Someone hurts you, you want to hurt them back. Someone criticizes you, you want to criticize them back. Someone does you wrong, you want, if either you want to do wrong to them or you want to see wrong done to them. It's the natural part of us. The natural part of us is, I want to hang out with people who, who you know, make me feel better about myself. I want to hang out with people who, who are you know, like me, share my interests. They're not you know, difficult to be around. That's who I want to hang out with. That's what the natural says. Evidence of God's kingdom in your life your individual life, is whether you have this other impulse, this other nature, this other voice that says, love the people who are unlovable. Show grace to the people who offend you. In fact, Try to bless those who hate you and those who are your enemies. That's not natural to us. Do it not because, hey, you're going to make a friend, and the more friends you make, the stronger you'll be, and now you'll be a stronger force. No. Do it whether they love you back or not. Do it whether... They, your enemy ends up killing you. Love them anyways. Forgive them anyways. Extend grace. If that's a really foreign thought to you, if you're like, I've never had that impulse ever, we need to talk, okay? We need to ask when you prayed to receive Christ, did you really receive Christ? Because the Bible promises us that when we ask Christ to be our Savior and Lord, He sends us His Spirit. And if you ever want to see what is evidence of that Spirit, which is really evidence of the kingdom, you know, Paul makes a nice, neat little list in Galatians 5. And he tells us, these shouldn't be foreign thoughts to us. These shouldn't be things that we don't get. We may not do it, and we may not do it well, but we know inside of us God is doing a work on us that's helping us to love our enemies and to extend grace to those who let us down. Disciples make God's kingdom their highest priority, and they do it in two ways. One is, you want that kingdom to be, to be showing up in your life. You want to know more about that love. You want to know more about that grace. You want to know more about that ability to forgive, and to reconcile. You hunger for it. It shows up there. 
But it also shows up here. It shows up in the community of faith. I've told you that one of the marks of a healthy church is how quickly are we to reconcile? How hard do we work to reconcile? Or how easily we sit and hold grudges? How easily we sit and get bitter? How easily we, we just, we, we won't work or we'll just go away? Mark of a healthy church is one that works for reconciliation. And understand, reconciliation is not easy. Unfortunately, people think it's easy. You know, the culture had such a hard time, American culture had such a hard time where our public, publicly our leaders would not say, I'm sorry. And for years you would never hear that. And then around the 80s and 90s, you know, somebody said it. And when somebody said it, they were so positively received, then everybody started apologizing all the time. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Saying I'm sorry is not reconciliation. Reconciliation is not just clearing up the problem. Reconciliation is making the relationship better and stronger. It's not just, hey, I'm sorry, hey, no problem, cool, we're good. No, we leave that problem, we leave that encounter better and stronger. Think about that. That is such genius by God. God takes the thing that would tear apart our groups, conflict, disagreements, disputes, hurt feelings, that should tear apart groups. He takes that and he says, if you will reconcile, it'll make you stronger. It'll make you better. But we're so stubborn sometimes, like little kids. We just dig our heels in. Ooh, you don't know what he said. You don't know what she did. You don't know how that makes me feel. I'm not going to budge. And we're like little kids thinking we're so righteous. And it doesn't get better. In fact, it would be better if the relationship had just fallen apart than having a bunch of people who hold grudges against each other, who, who smile to each other's faces. That doesn't advance the kingdom. That doesn't advance the cause of Christ. That shows that we're a bunch of phonies. We act like we care about each other, but deep down inside, we really don't. A healthy church is marked by reconciliation. And it's hard. I not only got to get over whatever you did to me, I got to accept you as a friend. And we got to move forward and be better and stronger. It's hard. But that's part of what it means to be God's kingdom. But he doesn't just say kingdom. He says his righteousness. You see, a lot of people are okay with the kingdom thing because it's kind of vague. And then if I talk about love and grace and forgiveness, that's okay too because it's kind of vague. And I really don't have to go to the Bible and understand love because, you know, we all know what love is, right? Do we? Do we really? I love when society defines love and Christians go, yep, that's it. You're letting society define what love is? God defines love. He defines it in the word of God. Stop letting society, stop letting celebrities, stop letting politicians, stop letting popular bloggers or you know, speakers or even Christian leaders define what love is. It's defined in the word of God. But some people, they like it because it's vague enough that I can make, I can kind of fill in the blank what love is. I can make it be whatever I want it to be. But Jesus doesn't give you that wiggle room. He says, seek ye first his kingdom 
and his righteousness. His righteousness. Disciples also make God's righteousness their highest priority. They want to be more like God, more like Jesus. You see, we've accepted in the church, I think, too easily this idea that, you know, morality, it's a, it's a floating term. I think that might be true about some things. But I think the Bible's really clear about other things. I think when the Bible talks about righteousness, it's not just talking about this vague sense of being in a right relationship with God. It does mean a right relationship with God, but it's a right relationship with God because we are obeying God. It's not a right relationship with God if we're being disobedient, if we're ignoring what he said, if we are reinterpreting it to make it fit our own lives, our own society, our own culture, our own morality. As Christians, we need to decide, do we believe in absolute truth or not? And if we believe in absolute truth, do we believe that the Bible is the revelation of God's absolute truth? Do we or don't we? And if we do, then we need to understand. We need to understand what God is saying in his word. And it needs to be our highest priority. Everybody wants to chase after love, God's love, God's love, God's love. Let's just accept, let's just forgive, let everybody do whatever they want to do as long as they're not hurting anybody else. It's cool. As long as I can't come up with a reason that it's wrong, it's okay. We leave behind holiness. We leave behind righteousness. I'll give you some examples of like kind of low-hanging fruit, okay? Okay? You know, I think I used this example before. I forget where I use them all. But let's say we were in a plane, all of us, and the plane crashes, but we all survive. And then we're kind of like floating there in the life rafts, and then, and then this, this, this guy comes out to meet us in a boat. And we can see in the horizon there's, there's two islands. And, and the guy says, okay, there's two islands, and you guys can choose which island to go to. On this island, okay, there's no laws. In fact, murder's okay, stealing's okay, lying's okay, you know, adultery, fornication, having sex with whoever you want, that's all good. It's all okay on this island. But on this island, people don't even think of killing each other. People don't even think of lying to each other. People don't even think of cheating on their spouses. You get to choose which island you're going to go to. If you believe the guy, I'm pretty sure most of us would go, I'm going to this island. But it's funny, because a lot of Christians are embracing a society that's the other island. Understand, God's rules are not arbitrary. God's morality is not just, he was one day sitting up there going, man, eh, what can I do? What rules can I make up for these humans? No. He made them for the kingdom. He made them because it reflects who he is. He made them because it's what a good society is. I sometimes think that the societal test for, for actions is, if you had more of it, would it make your society better or worse? And again, we have the low-hanging fruit. If we had more murderers, most of us would go, worse society. We should try to work to have fewer 
If we had more stealing, yeah, that's good societies if we have less stealing. But what about some of these other things that our society is currently de deciding what is good? I'm not even talking from a Christian standpoint, from a biblical standpoint. Simply asking from a societal standpoint, what is good? Is it a better world? Do we have better families? We work, we seek after God's righteousness, which means we have to understand it. America, I don't know when. It's 4th of July this week. I guess I should be, you know, be more pro-America, but let me just tell you, I don't know when we sold our souls. I know the first time I realized it was in the 90s. And I'm pretty sure it happened before that. I think it happened maybe back in the 40s. When we said righteousness, morality, character, none of that matters. Just get the job done. Just get the job done. We say that about celebrities. I don't care what your, what your lives are like. Just entertain me when you're in that movie or when you're giving that concert. What you do, what you stand for, what you believe, it doesn't matter. Just do your job. Entertain me. Politicians, I don't care what your character is. Just make government work. That's all I care about. Athletes, it's funny. Some of you guys aren't big sports fans, but if you're big sports fans, you've done this. You know you have. You got the guy on your team who, when he was on the other team and he kind of bent the rules, was kind of a bully and, you know, maybe, you know, hurting other people and you were like, oh, I hate that guy. I can't stand him. And then he's suddenly on your team. I love that guy. He's awesome. Why? Because we don't care about character. We care about winning. Just let my team win. We've let righteousness go by the side. Disciples make God's righteousness their higher pri highest priority. And the last point is just this. Look at the last part of, six, of that verse. He says, then, and all these things will be added unto you. All these things will be added unto you. He says, seek my kingdom, seek my righteousness, and I'll take care of those other things. But I think even that's kind of a misunderstanding of this verse. This is what I really think God is saying. I mean, what Jesus is saying. What I really think Jesus is saying is, seek my kingdom, seek my righteousness, and I will provide everything you need to seek my kingdom and seek my righteousness. He's not saying as some you know, some people today and, you know, with the prosperity gospel, he's not saying, you know, seek after me and I'll bless you. That's not what he's saying. I will provide whatever you need to seek my righteousness and seek my kingdom. Understand, it wouldn't make any sense for us to seek his righteousness, seek his kingdom, and then God gives us stuff that, that takes us away from that focus. It only makes sense that he would bless us and provide us with the things that helps us stay focused on seeking his kingdom and seeking his righteousness. We trust that God will provide all that we need. And so if we get this right, if we get this, this idea of what the kingdom is right, 
And that we're called as a church to be an example of that kingdom. And we're called as individuals to be, to be, to be living this kingdom out wherever we are. If we get that right, it makes everything better. I asked my Sunday school class this question, and they got it right, because my Sunday school class is smart. I asked them, would your marriage relationship have survived if you didn't have grace? They all said, no. Did grace make your marriage relationship better or worse? It made it better. When we get the kingdom right, when we get the righteousness right, love abounds, grace abounds. It makes my relationship with my spouse better. It makes my relationship with my children better. It makes my relationship with my coworkers better. It makes my relationship with my neighbors better. I get that right. It makes everything better. Doesn't mean it's easy. It just means it's better. Better doesn't mean happier. Unfortunately, in our world today, we've decided better is happier. No. It just makes it better. It makes it richer. It makes it deeper. See, if we get too caught up in our wants and our needs, we cannot seek his kingdom. And if you're only seeking his kingdom so that God will meet your wants and needs, you still don't get it. No, it's seek his kingdom. Seek his righteousness. Not as a hobby, not as a, you know, avocation. Seek it. It's the highest priority. Because it makes everything better. He will indeed take care of the rest.